The broadcast is now starting. Like All attendees time. are in listen-only mode. Okay. Good morning, folks. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, depending on the time zone you're in. My name is Preston Bucati. I am an attorney and consultant for IT Governance USA, and hopefully you can hear me wherever you are. We're broadcasting this and have some attendees across the United States, so I know uh, here where I am in Denver, Colorado, it's closing on our start time of 11 a.m. That puts us close to about 1 p.m. Eastern or 10 a.m. Pacific, depending on where you are. So thank you for joining, of course. Uh, again, my name is Preston Bucati. You see there in the bottom right. I'm going to give us another 60 seconds or so before diving into the course material today, just to give any last-minute stragglers coming back from the bathroom or grabbing a cup of coffee. And uh, we'll get started today discussing a much talked about piece of legislation, the General Data Protection Regulation and its interrelation with existing ISMS security frameworks. And basically how you're gonna try to work those two together, fit those two cogs together nicely so that they are aligned and that they operate smoothly. That way you're addressing risk in more of a comprehensive strategic approach as opposed to ad hoc, uh, you know, a, a common business jargon term I've heard used is putting out fires day to day, right? So rather than running around and putting out fires, maybe starting to put in place things like a fire sprinkler, an alarm system, et cetera, et cetera. So that way low risks are hand handled automatically, high risks can be addressed on a point by point basis depending on their value to the business. So with that, we'll get started. It is now 11 a.m. my time. Again, my name is Preston Bucati. I'm an attorney and consultant for IT Governance USA, teaching and talking about various European cybersecurity privacy laws. Today, we're going to be discussing GDPR compliance and information security, how you can reduce your data breach risks. So a bit of an overview of our agenda. We'll briefly discuss the GDPR, sort of its history and how we got to where we are today. I think that's important, although there is no shortage of information out there on GDPR, I think it's important to understand where this law comes from to help get a sense of the cultural background that we're dealing with, especially for those of us here in the US that maybe own or operate at international organizations. It's important to understand the various cultural viewpoints on these topics because different people we'll look at data differently than those of us in the U.S. may. Uh, then we're going to move on into examining a ISO 27001 aligned ISMS or Information Security Management System and how that can generally help support GDPR compliance. So as we go through the rest of the agenda, you see some of those things there, the top risks resulting in data benefits of implementing an ISMS. I'm going to do my best to kind of cross-reference ISO 27001 and GDPR so that you can see how as a company, if you are beginning to face a variety of regulatory, legal or contractual requirements, it's no longer going to be continually sustainable to address each of those issues ad hoc, like I just said, right? Ideally, more of a coordinated approach. And so that's sort of the benefit of implementing an ISMS from that, we'll then pivot and start to talk about the technical and organizational requirements you'll need to actually achieve compliance. So we'll get into it. First, like I said, in GDPR. So GDPR stands for General Data Protection Regulation, or as I've endearingly heard it termed here in the United States, the gosh darn privacy rule, came into effect in May of this year but for those of you in the know, you'll remember that GDPR was actually released in 2016. And so that 2016 to 2018 time period was intended to be sort of a wake up call, get your ducks in a row, um, you know, a, a runway, if you will, to allow organizations around the globe to get prepared so that when the law came into effect at the end of May this year, there would therefore now no longer be a waiting period, right? The law comes into effect May 25, you've had two years, we expect you to be compliant as of today. And we've actually already seen some regulators in the EU at least provisionally start to implement investigative or, or even remedial uh, actions against companies for violations of GDPR. Now, like I said, 
at the beginning of our presentation, I'd like to discuss some of the background of GDPR first. So you just heard me tell you that GDPR actually came out in 2016. Oh. At that time, if you'll remember, like, we as a country were kind of just coming off the heels of the Edward Snowden releases in 2014 and 2015. And so I think globally, as a, as a human society, we were all sort of in this weird moment where we had face to face with the idea that there is a vast amount of technology out there and available for consumers and government users alike. And it is collecting and processing more data than we had ever known to be possible. And we had never really thought about the privacy implications of that, right? What are the personal implications of passing around and using and storing and collecting all of this data? So in 2014 and 2015, Edward Snowden releases come out. There's a variety of other new related to data privacy. And as a result, I think the EU regulators decided now would be an opportune time for them to update their existing data privacy laws. So again, for those of you in the know, there was actually a law similar to GDPR on the books in place in Europe prior to GDPR. It was called the Data Protection Directive. It had been in place since the mid 90s. So again, around 2014, 2015, 2016 timeframe, perfect time to sort of take a step back, reassess the value of the law as it was in place, rewrite the law to account for new technology, as a result, we get GDPR. Now, again, like I said, this law didn't come out of just nowhere. There have actually been privacy type of laws on the books in various EU or European countries since basically after World War II. Um, uh, it, not too long after World War II in the mid 50s, privacy was recognized as a fundamental right in Europe. And surely for those of you on the call today, you can understand why that was so important in that post-war era. But uh, my whole point in outlining some of the history of GDPR is to help understand, again, that there is, a, there is a slightly different cultural lens when it comes to data and data privacy for the EU as compared to the United States. And the reason I bring that up is, for the most part, when I have gone to organizations to help them with GDPR compliance activities, the biggest stumbling block they often run into is that cultural hurdle, right? Um, just getting people in the United States to understand and appreciate the value that EU residents place on privacy and not that it is some newfangled right that they're all of a sudden wanting to exercise, but it's actually been something that they've had in place for a long time. And as a result, they will expect you to know these rights, these rules, these obligations, and they'll expect you to honor them in much the same way that European organizations have been honoring those rights for a number of years. So again, for those of you on international organizations, it may be your experience that your European subsidiaries are actually very close to, if not already over the top, GDPR compliant, whereas those US organizations or other ones around the globe, China, Russia, and others, typically have a much larger gap to close. So again, I think that's important to understand, especially as you go about working towards GDPR compliance. But the key difference that we have with a regulation today, as opposed to the previously existing data protection directive, is that a directive was more like a call to arms across the EU. And it was left to individual member states to implement laws that gave effect to those, let's say, obligations outlined in the directive. And what we were left with was a patchwork of individual uh, country specific regulations that had very different approaches endings of data privacy. Well, when the law was reformatted in 2014, 2015 and released in 2016 as a regulation, that basically meant it was the law of the land across the EU. A nice way to sort of analogize it for those of us in the states, difference between state and federal laws, right? Previously, there were a variety of state laws. Now we have this federal law type of version of e pan-European international law that says every EU member state will abide by these same principles, laws, rights, requirements, et cetera, right? So you see there the last bullet on the slide is just a very general high level summary. The GDPR is requiring organizations to adopt appropriate policies, procedures, and processes to protect the personal data they hold. It's not saying that you can no longer collect personal data. 
It's not saying that you can no longer use or analyze data. It's just saying that we need to take a more sensible approach to data collection and data processing. And that sensible approach is ideally based on risk, right? That will help us build a secure model of data use going forward into the 21st century. So how can ISO 27001 help you in your GDPR compliance efforts? Well, perhaps a first place to start for us is what exactly is ISO 27000? Well, ISO stands for International Standardization Organization. This body releases a variety of frameworks from information security to general risk management to health and safety, quality management. They are a variety of frameworks or guiding management principles that you can implement across your organization to help bring a level of standardization to the way you do business. And in that way, help bringing a level of efficiency, economy of scale, et cetera, et cetera. So like I said, there's a variety of topics covered in the ISO family. 27,001, that numeric moniker is the number association with information security risk management. So there are a variety of ISO papers in the 27,000 family. 27,001 is the standard. And what you can actually do as an organization is you can adopt some of these working principles at your organization and you can go out and get audited and get a third party verified audit, get a certificate that says we are ISO certified. And as a result, when you go around and do business with suppliers, with vendors, with customers and clients, you can pull out that certificate and show them, hey, somebody audited our information security system. Somebody looked at our IT processes and they have deemed them to be valid. That's becoming increasingly common in the clients we see with ITG. A lot of people are working out there trying to scrounge up new business. And because data and information security is becoming so paramount, especially with breaches constantly reaching news headlines, Information security is paramount. So as a result, everybody before they sign a contract is saying, hey, I want to know how do you handle IT or information security? And often the situation I've seen is you're stuck with two, two sort of alternatives. Number one, a customer or a supplier or vendor will say, hey, show us your ISO certificate. If you've got a valid certificate, we're happy to sign the contract and move on with business. If you can't provide a certificate, no worries. Please, though, fill out this questionnaire. Please describe your IT processes. Please be willing to open up and meet with us next Tuesday when we have our audit team come and investigate you. So you can see that although ISO compliance and like we'll talk about over the course of the day, it's actually a nice framework to adopt because it can help align your processes to be compliant with a variety of laws across international jurisdictions. It's also increasingly becoming becoming common in the business world to help demonstrate that sort of third party level of credibility, right? Instead of wasting time with expensive audit procedures or even more expensive litigation down the road, why don't we just make sure that people are ISO compliant, make sure that they have a valid information security system. And that way, if we use their cloud service platform or if we give our customer data to that company, we know that our confidential or sensitive information is going to be secure. So back to the slide here, how does an ISO 27001 aligned ISMS support your compliance efforts? Well, very simply, like I said, it outlines a framework to help give you a strategic, comprehensive approach to risk management. So what you'll actually go through as you go about implementing an ISMS project is you'll start to focus on three pillars the people, processes, and technology involved at your organization related to your core IT assets, your core data within those assets or within systems or other assets, right? So maybe you're the IT group manages servers, but you've also got to deal with the CRM that's handled by the salespeople and, oh, marketing team as an instance of Marketo, we need to look out. Again, thinking back to GDPR, we have to focus on personal data and where that risk lies. So we take that systematic approach to our IT assets and our data risks, and we start to develop security controls to manage those risks on an ongoing sensible basis, right? And what you'll see as you actually work with 
an ISO alignment project is that you are trying to do this on a very risk-based approach. High-risk things addressed first, they're high priority, they get the money, budget, and time. Low-risk things, we'll get to them next year. And maybe there's even a level of acceptable risk criteria which your organization is willing to acknowledge and bake in and live with. On the flip side, maybe there's some risk you can get rid of altogether, right? Maybe you stop collecting certain sensitive bits of data or you offload security requirements to your cloud service provider, whatever the case may be. There are a variety of things within an ISO implementation project which will help bring strategic guidance to the way you manage information security. As a result, when you're managing information security, naturally you're gonna manage information and the personal data therein. So before I go on to the top risks of data breaches, I just wanna to try to talk about a little bit of some of the alignment between ISO 27000 and GDPR. So some of this you may need to take notes. There will not be a quiz later, but uh, happy to discuss and reach out when we have a question period, if you like, or you can email me directly after the call to get more information on this topic. But again, just some of the ways that GDPR and ISO are, are, are aligned. So for those of you that are very familiar with the articles of GDPR, you'll remember that Article 5 and Article 32 require data controllers and data processors to implement what I call TOMS. And that stands for Technical and Organizational Measures, T-O-M-S, to ensure a level of security appropriate to the risk. Again, if you focus on the particular language of Article 32, you'll actually see it says, in assessing the appropriate level of security, account shall be taken of the risks that are presented by processing. It then goes on to tell us, here are some ideas for what security appropriate to the risk may include. But that topic, the idea that you should be taking technical and organizational measures to incur, ensure a level of security appropriate to the risk is actually well aligned to the clauses, or I should say maybe more like the high level sections of ISO 27001. So clause 6.1.2 tells us that ISO organizations should be identifying risks associated with the loss of confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information, a common definition of information security, that CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. The organization is also required to identify risk owners, determine the levels of risk, and establish information security objectives that result from risk assessment and risk treatment processes. So again, to kind of focus it back, GDPR tells us that we need to manage personal data in a way that's an appropriate given the level of risk involved. What does that mean? Well, at a basic level and without more guidance from EU courts, what I can tell you is that obviously there are certain bits of personal data that are more confidential than others, right? I don't care, frankly, from a personal point of view, if you have my business contact email, it's on LinkedIn, it's all over the company, no big deal if that happens to be breached. Yeah, I might be upset, but I'm not going to be as upset if you breach my social security number, my credit card information, my geolocation data, or God forbid, biometric data, right? So GDPR tells us that you can take a risk-based approach to managing the personal data you hold. And in fact, that's nicely aligned to ISO 27001 Clause 6, because the whole point is that you're basically taking a risk-based approach to information security management. Now, Clause 5 of ISO goes on to say that management shall ensure information security policies and objectives are set, integrated, comp and compatible with the organization's strategic direction. The idea is that you're having management involved in this process. You're not just the IT or the compliance or legal GRC ERM group out there running around dreaming up ideas. You're constantly checking in with executive management to get their buy-ins, their support, their approval and make sure that your actions are aligned with the organization's overall objectives. Now that aligns nicely to GDPR Article 39, because Article 39 tells us that a data protection officer shall inform and advise the controller or processor and its employees of their obligations under GDPR and shall monitor compliance with the regulation. So GDPR actually calls out the idea that we need a role an actual articulated role at some level of executive management to sit back and look out for data privacy compliance issues. Interesting, right? So again, you can see how ISO says management should be involved. GDPR actually says we 
want to go a step further and make sure there is an actual human with a job title that's focusing on this within the management system. Now, to keep talking about security, ISO 27001, like I said, it lists a variety of controls that you can help manage security effectively. Now, the, in order to achieve certification to the standard, you don't have to use the controls outlined by ISO. Within Annex A of ISO 27001, they actually list 114 security controls that they have suggested as appropriate to help manage information security risk. Control A16 says that information security events shall be reported through proper internal channels immediately, assessed to determine if they rise to the level of an incident, documented and investigated. Anybody on the call, I know the mics are closed, but can you think of a GDPR article that talks about information security incidents and events? Well, to my mind, I'm immediately thinking of Article 33 under the GDPR. And that's the famous article, if you've seen it out there on the blogosphere, which says that the controller must notify relevant supervisory authorities without undue delay and where feasible, not later than 72 hours after becoming aware of personal data breach. So ISO, the standard has a variety of clauses to help address information security incidents and business continuity planning. That's perfectly aligned to GDPR because GDPR is telling us if you have an information security incident and if it poses a certain sufficient level of risk to the data subjects involved based on the personal data they're in, you have a very strict time window within which you are required to report that to regulatory authorities. So again, the idea is that GDPR maybe drills down and tells us exactly what we're supposed to be doing, but ISO can help tell us how to get there and not just how to get there today, but how to stay there tomorrow and how to make sure we are not that far away next year, next quarter, next season, whatever the cycle is. So what are some top results in data breaches? Well, you, if you're anything like me, are inundated constantly with news from the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times or the LA Times or the Daily Register in the UK, it seems like somebody is always getting hacked. I know Facebook was recently in the news. Google Plus was recently in the news. There's definitely more intense scrutiny on social media platforms leading up to our US midterm elections. Breaches happen all the time. And I think it's safe to say that we are now in a world where it's not a matter of when, but if, or excuse me, not a matter of if, but when. Five years ago, if you were a small to medium enterprise, you maybe could have hid within the pack, right? Safety and numbers, ah, they're only going after the big guys. I don't have a target on my back. Well, now hackers have evolved like they constantly do. And they recognize that the Facebooks and Googles of the world have an army of IT staff out there battling them. And if you're a small law firm or a medium sized accounting firm or even a regular sized hospital, chances are you don't have the same resources devoted to IT security that a lot of the bigger Fortune 500 companies do. As a result, you are now the primary target for hackers because whether it's through technical means, malware, SQL injections, ransomware, whatever the case may be, or whether it's more traditional human means, what social engineering, chances are at some point, somebody is trying to breach your security perimeter. In fact, I just read a report that was released this year from Verizon, almost 90% of all organizations have experienced a data breach that they acknowledge. Internally. Now, that's, of course, external. You see some other statistics here on the slide. 73% of data breaches are perpetrated by outsiders. But what does that mean? That means at least a quarter or more of data breaches are actually perpetrated by insiders. That could be aggrieved current employees. That could be aggrieved past employees, especially if you don't have a good HR life cycle that removes or changes passwords, removes security access when these people leave the door, right? Now, a lot of money and attention is being spent on cybercrime from organized criminal groups, 
not just abroad. Think about our, you know, our, the, the mafia and other groups here in the United States. Organized crime has evolved to look at the value in data and not just personal data under GDPR, but what about your financial data, your IP trade secrets, any M&A deals you have going on. There's a variety of information that can be monetized. Now, you'll see here, interestingly, although it's a very catchy topic for the news, a relatively low percentage of data breaches are actually conducted by state affiliated actors. And if you read that Verizon report, again, email me or send me a note later, happy to share it with you. There are increasingly less state affiliated data breaches happening in the private sector. For the most part, it's my understanding that state affiliated data breaches are either occurring on our government systems or they're tr typically trying to hack large organizations to exactly get at those trade secrets. And so often the case is that you'll see um, uh, 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 hackers affiliated with China that have been accused of breaching for um, corporate espionage. Now, some other things that I want to call out on this slide before we move forward. You'll see something interesting here at the top. The slide title says, what are the leading cause of data breaches, right? Well, an interesting thing to note under GDPR is that the definition of data breach is actually much more vague than it has ever been. And that's an important concept under GDPR entirely, is that when they updated this law, to take into account new technology, to make it a pan-European standard, they actually also expanded the definitions of a variety of common terms. So what constitutes personal data under GDPR? Almost anything you can think of. What constitutes a data breach under GDPR? Anything you, almost anything you can think of. Any unauthorized disclosure is actually technically a data breach. So you'll see there, number three, 28% involved internal actors. That statistic also includes accidental disclosures. Somebody emailing client files to the wrong client. Somebody accidentally providing information over the phone. So the big risk there that you need to take away from this slide is not just that you need to have a technically secure perimeter around your network infrastructure, you also need to be working on training and awareness campaigns to make sure that your own staff don't subject you to an accidental or intentional data breach. And in fact, another statistic from that Verizon report, apparently 4% of people will always click on a phishing email. That's just the statistic they had. And granted, you got to take statistics with a bit of a grain of salt, but 4% of all people are going to click phishing emails no matter what. Chances are, in reality, you've got a much higher percentage of people that are accidentally signing up for services, clicking on survey links to get a free gift card, or downloading some sort of third-party platform onto your corporate assets over your corporate network, signing up for and sharing permissions that you had no idea they would ever be doing. So you've, again, not just got to focus on the technology and the processes, you've also got to focus on the people, which is exactly what ISO has us doing. So some more statistics here on the history of data breaches. 48% of breaches feature hacking, 51% include malware, and 81% of those leverage stolen or weak passwords. Again, no amount of technology is ever going to help you if the processes aren't simple and user friendly and if people aren't trained and aware of how to follow those processes and how to use that technology. 17% of breaches are caused by social engineering attacks. These are actually very effective and they are increasingly used by hackers going after high value targets. I've heard a phrase that goes, um, you know, uh, Amateurs hack technology, professionals hack people. And for those of you that think I would never be subject to a social engineering attack, let me just demonstrate a story to you that happened at my old organization. An email came from the CEO of one of our big clients, and he said, hey, I thought you guys were going to be sending us a $10,000 check last week. It was my impression that the check was sent, but our bank is indicating that it has never actually been received. Do you mind resending that check to this new account? The accounting person 
embarrassed that the check didn't go through, wanting to be helpful, wanting to meet any of the obligations of the customer and leave them satisfied and smiling, immediately cut a new $10,000 check and wired it to the new account, right? Didn't want to offend anybody, didn't want to admit a mistake, just wanted to make sure business continued as usual. Well, actually what happened, that was a hacker who had infiltrated our system, found out by spying on our emails who some of our big customers were, how they talked, how their emails looked with logos and phrasing. And they simply sent a spam phishing email with a fake account number to an account in China. And when that money was sent, it was gone and we never saw it again. So I bring up the idea of social engineering again, just because a lot of people tend to think that hacking is a technological issue that can be solved with technological weapons. Not always the case. Again, people processes technology. People want to be liked. They want to do well in their job. And so often they are very weak avenues that hackers can exploit. They are a vulnerability unto themselves. And that's why training and awareness campaigns are so important as a part of information security. You can see some other statistics there. 12% of quote unquote breaches, again, keep in mind it breaches almost anything under GDPR. Those can be caused by errors and privilege misuse, bad access controls. The other feature physical actions. Maybe somebody breaks into your office and your server is not stored in a locked room. Or as I've seen at some small organizations, right, the server is in a dusty broom closet in the basement next to the fire extinguisher that hasn't been checked in 10 years and everybody can go in that room, right? There are a variety of security controls you can put in place to limit your risk exposure. And that's the benefit of implementing an ISMS like ISO 27001, is it helps you understand what your risk exposure is so that you can take educated and informed decisions to manage high risk activities on a high priority timeline, right? Kind of thinking of that balance between urgency and importance, whereas your lower risk items are at least going to be acknowledged. Maybe there are some easy, cheap security controls you can put in place to help mitigate those risks and reduce their probability or likelihood even further. But naturally, there's always going to be some risks that you as a business have to live with, what we call residual risk. And so as a result, if you at least document that and acknowledge it, you are proving to other organizations whom you do business with that you have a plan in place, right? So have you considered this risk? Yes, we have. We actually looked at it last year and here's what we've done to control it. We uh, are waiting to implement new technology until the cost of that technology goes down. Just an example, but you can see other benefits on this slide of ISO 27000. It secures your information. It reduces the need for frequent external audits, frankly, because you're already going to be subject to some. It helps build a system that protects the CIA of your data. Again, that core part of information security. Like I talked about earlier in the slides, it helps you win new business and retain existing customers. Over 33,000 organizations around the world have ISO 27001 certification and that number is increasing exponentially every year. The standard also helps you respond to evolving security threats. Like I said at the beginning of the slide, you stop putting out fires and start putting in a fire prevention system. You stop looking down at your feet, worrying about what pothole you're going to step into next, and you start looking up at the road ahead of you so that you can avoid the issue before it even comes down your path. So along those lines, there are a variety of other benefits, right? Reducing costs, improving culture, facilitating compliance. The whole idea here is that you're building a comprehensive framework and process-atized approach to risk management. Now, I talked about the three pillars of information security, and we bring it up here again because it is so important. ISO acknowledges, and so does GDPR, that risk flows into a variety of buckets. But if you really want to categorize them, there's three main vectors, people, processes, and technology. Technology, you can think of no end of technological solutions that help secure your information or your personal data. Processes are certainly important. Definitely something I've seen with some of our more tech-focused clients. A lot of small startups love to have that entrepreneurial spirit. Look, we don't hire people to tell them how to do their job. We hire them to tell us how to do our job, right? I think that's a quote from Steve Jobs. 
very nice in theory. The problem is you have people out running around creating a thousand different ways to build a mousetrap. And every time somebody gets hired at the organization, you're coming up with a new process for marketing or sales or product management. It's best from a corporate governance point of view to help drive efficiency to start to document some of those processes and procedures through a variety of policy documents so that everybody is aware of how you are actually working to achieve your high level business objectives. Ultimately, the goal is to sell widgets and make money. Maybe there's some tangential goals to improve corporate social responsibility and make the world a better place. That's great, but how are you actually going to get there? That's why processes are important. <laughs> it's not that we want to tie people to a desk and make them do their job a certain way, but it's about trying to bring some sort of formal structure to the way that business is done. That way we can help make sure that day-to-day -day actions at the cubicle are aligned and everybody is marching in the same direction. Now that brings us to our last pillar here of people, right? People often with linkest link, excuse me, the weakest link in the security chain, in part because they want to be helpful, they want to be useful, frankly, in part because for most people, maybe not the ones on this call, but for a lot of people, information technology, IT and ISMS, that world is confusing. It's confusing and complicated. I don't want to know how the internet works. I just want to go to yahoo.com to check my email, right? That is why people are often your weakest link. And so that's why training and awareness is a huge piece of the puzzle when it comes to information security. And in fact, that's why GDPR calls out training specifically, right? Because you need people in place working with those processes, working with those technologies that have the appropriate level of competence and you also need to make sure that they have appropriate resources when they go about doing their day to day. So that way you're not continually subjecting yourself to new risk, shooting yourself in the foot, even though you just spent all this time and money to become GDPR compliant, right? So what are some of the technical and organizational requirements to achieve GDPR compliance? Like I talked about Article 32, Article 5. Well, Article 32 leaves us with some sort of drilled down idea, which is nice because for those of you with a legal background, you know often laws are written quite vaguely and left up to individual interpretation. Article 32 does give us some examples though, right? So maybe you can take measures to pseudonymize or encrypt personal data. Pseudonymization is the idea that you are stripping the personally identifiable aspects of the data from the data itself. So maybe if you've got user account data and some of that account data is tied to uh, statistics or usage stats for a machine or for an app, maybe you can keep those usage statistics separate from the client identifying information, right? You know, names, account numbers, those sorts of things. And so the idea is that you've now got two buckets of data, one of which is personal data, and you can control and manage that risk separately from the bucket of non-personal data, maybe subject to a different security environment that costs a little less or the resources are allocated differently. Now, encryption is also recognized as a way to uh, secure data under GDPR. The idea there is you're just subjecting it, again, technology, just a high level of technical encryption. And as long as you don't lose access to the encryption key, the idea under GDPR is that in theory, you have really never given away access to the personal data. Now, GDPR also tells us, you'll see the third bullet point, we need to be able to restore the availability and access to personal data in a timely manner in the event of a physical or technical incident. That is similar to ISO. There are a variety of clauses under the standards that help deal with business continuity and disaster recovery planning. If this isn't something your organization has done, something to perhaps turn around and start doing at the end of this call, look at the clauses outlined in ISO and see what you should be doing to outline a business continuity plan. Oftentimes I see contracts that assign dollar amounts for time periods of outages. So if you are a platform as a service provider, a cloud service provider, software as a service provider, you want to make sure that when your systems go down, whatever the cause, that you are available to resume business operations as usual, as usual because 
guess what? Loss of availability or loss of access to data when you need it, that's technically a breach under GDPR. And so you may be subject to that 72-hour notification window and everything else that comes along with it. So certainly having backups, whether it's... Hello? Sorry, folks. Got a bit of feedback there. Sorry about that. I think somebody joined with their mic open. Um, so uh, like I was saying, it, this third bullet point on Article 32 on the slide, consider having a disaster recovery and or business continuity plan in place, not just a matter as a matter of GDPR compliance, but also as a general business prophylactic. Your risk exposure increases exponentially when outages occur, and you need to be able to ensure that you can recover information, that you can get the organization back to running as business as usual. That way your customers, suppliers, vendors don't notice any issues. They don't have any contractual problems to come litigate. And the sooner you do that, the less likely you are to fall within that 32 hour reporting window under GDPR's data breach notification statute. Now the last bullet point here is perfectly aligned to ISO. GDPR says we need to implement a process for regularly testing assessing and evaluating the effectiveness of technical and organizational measures for ensuring the security of data processing. Well, guess what? That is exactly what ISO is. It is a process for regularly testing, assessing, and evaluating the effectiveness of our security controls. In fact, some of the later clauses in the, under the ISO standard deal with risk management, which deals with risk assessment, risk treatment, and then there is actually a separate monitoring and evaluating clause that deals with, okay, you know, once we review the risk profile and we test our security controls, let's actually take a step back and kind of look at this from an internal audit point of view. Are the security controls doing what we intended them to do? Are we still aligned with the business objectives that management outlined at the start? So ISO is perfectly aligned because it helps you, or excuse me, it helps guide you on the reporting structure and other requirements that help manage data protection. Again, ISO thinking about information security generally, so not just personal data, but your financial data, your IP data, employee health information that you may manage on an HR perspective, et cetera, et cetera. Conformity with ISO 27001 provides strong evidence of compliance with GDPR Article 32 security requirements. And that's because both regimes focus on the risk associated with the loss of CIA, again, the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of protected data. Both regimes require internal leadership to work with other professionals throughout the organization to map data processing activities and assess risks to both the organization and data subjects. And that will help you understand your risk profile based on the sensitivity of information you hold. Now, ISO gives us the vocab term or acronym ISMS, which stands for Information Security Management System. The important point of ISO is that you're bringing this systematized approach to information security management. So what does that mean? What does ISO tell us a management system is? Well, like I said, it, it, it's not just that ad hoc approach to risk and putting out fires as they pop up. It's taking a more comprehensive and structured look at it. Take into account the context of your organization. What industry are you in? What sector of the economy? What are your competitors doing, right? If you're a Google or a Facebook, you may have obligations that are different onto and apart from small and medium organizations. Now your management system is also gonna work closely with leadership. Again, trying to get executive buy-in and support across the organization horizontally so that you can drill down into IT risks in each silo with support and approval as necessary. Naturally, that's gonna involve planning and operation, right? No project of this size where you go about cleaning your information security assets is not gonna occur without some version of planning and operation. But like I just talked about on the back end, there is that evaluation piece. So you sit back, you review, and make sure from an audit perspective, are the controls, are the approaches, are the methodologies that we've adopted 
actually circling back and working well? Are they aligned with what leadership told us? And are they reducing the risk that they in the ways that we thought that we would? If so, great, let's continue to improve. And if not, what can we do to make it better on the next iteration? So what does good security look like under an ISO aligned ISMS? Well, you need leadership support and commitment. It's going to involve the entire organization, and that's often why leadership support and commitment is key. You need somebody chasing around all the low-level folks with a stick or a carrot. It's built around a business-focused risk management methodology, right? Assessing risks and taking corresponding appropriate risk. Considers the people, process, and technology triad along with the CIA triad. So keep in mind, confidentiality and integrity are three legs of a stool. If you encrypt data very heavily, that is going to protect the confidentiality and integrity of that data, certainly, but it may make it not as available to the people who need it. So there's a balance with CIA. Now, your good security obviously should be lending itself to regular reviews. That way you can continue to monitor its status, its effectiveness, and hopefully improve it over time, not just internally, but also that third party level of audit. It's not like you need to work at the company three years to figure out who does what, right? Anybody can step in and understand how you manage risk. That way, when they decide to do business with you, they can appreciate your approach to risk management. Increasingly called out under both GDPR, ISO, and a variety of similar data privacy laws around the globe, we have to focus on incident monitoring and response planning. But ideally, at the end of all of this, you'll be following a best practice that you've established, tailor-made to your organization, that is also internationally accepted and supported under an accreditation. So how to get started with your ISMS? Nine-step approach outlined here courtesy of ITG. The first step, establish your project mandate, right? Where are we going with this? Who, from a senior point of view, is going to be committed? What are their objectives? What's our overall goal with the project? From there, you can go into project initiation. And those of you with a PMP background will be familiar with a lot of those topics. Setting up a team, assembling that team, outlining KPIs or other deliverables, drawing up a RACI matrix to make sure you contact appropriate parties at various stages of the project. Part three is the actual ISMS initiation, where you actually reach out to the various stakeholders that manage or the assets and start to work with them, establish what documentation is in place, what risks are already being managed. That way you can help get your baseline and look at a gap analysis. At that point, you're going to circle back and bring in management, a continual piece of the puzzle under ISO. You want to make sure that management is aligned and supportive of what you found, where you're going, what the next step is. That's also becoming increasingly important as the rubber meets the road on your project, as you start to communicate with other folks around the organization, making sure that they understand management support is there and that this is aligned with an overall business objective. So once you identify your baseline security criteria in step five, you can start to assess how effective your ex existing controls are. Baseline security criteria is going to be things like your existing legal or regulatory obligations on top of your existing contractual obligations, which in my experience, most organizations are adopting contractual obligations on an ad hoc basis, frankly, if they're adopting them at all. Wink, wink, nod, nod, nod from the legal department. So. What I mean to say there is you'll need to understand what are the obligations you already have and how well are you meeting those before you can move forward and evolve into a best practices methodology. So once you outline your baseline security criteria, you're then going to focus on the risk management piece. Assess what risks exist today. Start to define criteria for what will be accepted or what will be mitigated and what controls will be used to mitigate risk respectively. From there, you can draft what is called a statement of applicability. That's a document required under ISO, and that helps align what our risk approach is to what is actually being covered, right? So maybe you've only got certain business areas or certain subsidiaries or certain assets under review. That's the point of the statement of applicability there, to help tie down what are we doing to what and when. From there, once you've got all these processes outlined, you move into stage seven, that's implementation. You just go around and do things. Now, the big piece there is circling back with the management, making sure that staff are aware with training and education programs. On the back end, then, you just measure, monitor, and review. 
you evaluate constantly to determine the levels of existing effectiveness, and you start to draft these reports to note current existing gaps or plan as you re- as achieve a level of maturity, plan for future expected gaps and start to address those ahead of time. If you get all of that done and the engine is running smoothly, then you can start to focus on stage nine. That's the external certification to the ISO standard where you would actually hire a certification body to come do an audit and they would give you that seal of approval, that ISO certificate valid for three years, which you can in turn show to all of your business partners and post on the website because you are now an ISO certified organization. So a big focus like I've talked about is the risk management piece that involves risk assessment and corresponding risk treatments. You treat risk through a variety of controls Often those controls are are divided into four buckets. So you can avoid a risk under a GDPR-like example. Maybe you're collecting certain bits of Article 9 sensitive categories of data that you ultimately determine doesn't have business value or you just don't need it. Well, then get rid of it, right? Don't collect that data anymore. Delete data you're not using. Avoid the risk entirely. Now, maybe there's some risks you can modify with controls, right? Uh, Maybe we don't collect first name. We just do first initial or maybe um, you know we, we put user preferences are, are, are available to be uh, edited by the user him or herself. That way the organization is not responsible for some of the data subject rights like integrity or accuracy. Now some risk can be shared. Certainly there's a variety of risk being shared at your organization today. I'd advise you to read your contracts with AWS or Azure, Office 365, et cetera, Make sure you understand who is actually owning what risk. And again, I I would advise them if you are using heavily cloud service providers, double check those contracts and see what they've pushed back to you and what you may actually own as a risk that you didn't know you did. Finally, that last bucket, some risk is residual. Like I said, you, you have to live with some risk in order for a business to move forward. And part of the benefit or the point of ISO is acknowledging that there is always that residual level of risk, but hopefully it's a small, low impact, low volatility risk, and it's not a high risk that could bring your business crashing to a halt, right? Now, so like I said earlier in the slides, ISO includes a set of 114 controls in Annex A. Those are designed to mitigate or modify your information security risks. They're divided into 14 categories, but the standard doesn't mandate that you have to use these controls. There are a variety of other controls out there. If you're familiar with these acronyms, NIST, COBIT, UK Cyber Essentials, and others, variety of controls in place. The idea with ISO is that you need to bring some sort of a framework to this approach, complete a statement of applicability, and then define a risk treatment plan so that we all around the globe can know that you're addressing risk in a coordinated manner. You see here the 14 control sets of Annex A, which are also welcome to uh, reach out to ITG for more information on this documentation. These are basically just the sections of controls called out in ISO 27001 Annex A. So you can see they actually talk about things like organization of information security or cryptography or things like uh, system acquisition or the information security aspects of business continuity management, supplier relations and articles. All of those increasingly important, not just because it's a matter of managing risk, but also, like I said, it maps to GDPR. So ISO 27001 clauses 8 and 9 deal with outsourced processes and vendor contracts. And in fact, control A.15 states that you will mitigate risk to the organization presented by suppliers that have access to personal data. Control category 18 says you will avoid breaches of contractual responsibilities to maintain privacy and security of personal information. Have we heard some more language? In GDPR, Article 28 says controllers shall only use processors guaranteeing appropriate technical and organizational safeguards. Processors may not subcontract to other processors without controller consent and an appropriate contract. Processors share responsibility for security and access. So you can see how they're nicely aligned, and by adopting ISO, you will help achieve compliance with GDPR. Now, how do you actually get there? ISO is long, it's complicated, and it's sometimes a costly implementation process, and that's why ITG exists to help you through that. 
we are here to take on your growing pains and get you from a level of adolescence to maturity with information security management through a variety of packages. So we have options available if you're simply interested in purchasing the ISO standard and achieving certification on your own. That's available all the way up to on-hand training courses and consultancy to actually work with you. We have a variety of other documentations or technological tools out there. So from reading and guidance to policies and procedural templates, all the way to a risk assessment software to help you manage that risk assessment and risk tr treatment piece. All of this going on in ISO compliant ways, oftentimes through employees that have previously worked within the ISO framework. So a lot of these consultants and training leaders really know their stuff on getting ISO certification. Or what now we have some certification courses available that can help educate you more in depth on this topic. I'm actually going to be teaching a lead implementer course tomorrow along with some other of these courses later in November and December. I'd advise you to check out our website for more information there. But we've got a foundation course that's a one day course intended to sort of give you the basics of what ISO implementation is all about. Whereas the longer lead implementer course is three days and that we actually get into the weeds of going through an ISO project. And so whereas a foundation is maybe a high level understanding of all things ISO, the 27,001 lead implementer course is gonna be much more boots on the ground about project implementation. Now, you can see there, oftentimes it makes sense to do both as a bundle because, hey, why not start with an understanding of the topic before getting into the weeds? But again, a variety of options available depending on your level of experience and expertise on the topic. How do you get in touch with us? Well, after this call, you'll certainly have our contact information, but this slide deck that we'll send out has a variety of other communication methods as well. So you're welcome to visit our website or give us a phone call or an email. We've got staff located across the U.S., so for the most part, regardless of what time zone you may be tuning in from, we can hopefully get some local help on the line for you. Certainly available on social media as, there, uh, as well there on the bottom, but uh, phone call, email, website, also always great ways to reach out to us for more information on either our products and services. So generally, if you're looking for some quick help and easy guidance on the topic, IT governance has been in business in Europe as one of the first British organizations to actually achieve certification to the standard. So they've been doing this for 20 years. They are well versed in it, not just internally, but also externally as well, helping a variety of organizations to achieve 